Hey, 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 thanks for watching the video, guys. It's Mr. Moore. Today's notes are on the water cycle. Let's get started. All right, so if you wanna just write a quick definition down for the water cycle, it will be the continuous movement of the water into the air, onto land, and back into the air over and over again. Now let's talk about these parts to the water cycle. But first, let's talk about water. How does water change states? Think about it. How do you get ice? How do you get steam? How does steam turn into water? Can ice turn into steam? Well, I guess it has to turn into water first. I'm just playing with you. By adding or removing heat energy. If we add heat energy, we move closer and closer to steam. If we remove heat energy, we move closer and closer to ice. If you're in the middle, you're at water. Now let's talk about the water cycle. So where does the energy that powers the water cycle come from? Hmm, think about it. Maybe a big hint in this image. Yeah, the sun. The water cycle is driven by the sun. Driven by the sun. Driven by the sun. Driven, driven, driven by the sun. And the energy that it provides. Let's talk about the very first part of the water cycle I like to call evaporation. Now in your notes, it says, evaporation is the process where a liquid in this case, water changes from its liquid state to a gaseous state. And sure enough, in the image, we see the solar energy from the sun evaporating the water. Now you can't see evaporation. It's kind of like an invisible magic. But I'm gonna try to show you an image that's gonna hopefully give you an idea of what's happening when things evaporate. So the water in the lakes and the oceans and the rivers, or even a puddle sitting on the road, is all being heated by the sun. And if the wind blows along, that's just gonna speed things along. The water slowly evaporates into water vapor. You can't see water vapor, it's invisible. If you look into the sky and you say, oh look, a cloud, you're actually looking at condensation. You're not looking at evaporation. So evaporation is a process, you can't see it, but you can see that it's happening. Just go outside, leave a glass of water, come back in a couple hours. I bet you that water has lowered. That's evaporation. During evaporation, impurities in the water are left behind. As a result, the water that goes up into the atmosphere is cleaner than when it was down on the earth. Now condensation is the opposite of evaporation. Evaporation is turning water into water vapor. Condensation is going the other way around. We're taking that invisible water vapor and we're cooling it down to turn it back into liquid water. This is forming water droplets. Now when these water droplets are first formed and they're very tiny, they actually remain suspended in the air. And that's what we call clouds. As the water droplets come together, they form larger and larger droplets, and soon they get too big, falling down to the sky, which is precipitation. If you wanna write down a definition for condensation, I would write down water vapor in the air gets cold and changes back into liquid, forming clouds. So that way you'll remember, condensation is cloud formation. If you see down on this image, the Dr. Pepper can getting all sweaty, that's because the warm air in the room is touching the cold can. And so the water vapor that's in the room is condensing onto the can. All right, let's move on to that other thing I was talking about, precipitation. When the temperature is just right, kind of like Goldilocks, no, I'm just kidding. The small droplets of water will come together, forming larger droplets. Then they start to rain down on the earth, precipitation. As the raindrops fall down to the earth, they could be rain, they could be sleet, they could be hail, they could be snow. There's lots of forms of precipitation. It doesn't all have to be just rain. But what happens after the rain falls down? There's two things. One, it can actually run off. And the other thing is it can infiltrate. First, let's talk about runoff. So much of the water that returns to the earth as precipitation actually runs off of the surface. This water can flow downhill into streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. So this is all considered runoff. If you want to add runoff to your notes, I would write down water flows across land and collects in rivers, streams, and eventually the oceans. Go ahead and pause if you need to write that down. Because guess what? We're moving on to that other thing, infiltration. Infiltration is an important process where rainwater soaks into the ground, 
into the soil and underlying rock layers. In this image, we're looking at runoff versus infiltration. We see that we're gonna get less runoff and more infiltration on gentle or flat terrain. If we're on heavy, steep terrain, we're gonna have more runoff and less infiltration. Water needs to sit on the ground to give it time to infiltrate. I bet you're wondering what happens when the water infiltrates. Well, it turns into groundwater. You can add this to your notes if you want to. It's water located within the rocks below the earth's surface, but I'm not gonna talk about it because I'm gonna do a PowerPoint on that next. So we're gonna save that for next time. The last thing I wanna talk to you guys about is transpiration. And just like evaporation, transpiration is just where water is entering the atmosphere. The only difference is it's coming out of the leaves of plants. So to add this to your notes, one final process in the water cycle. As plants absorb water from the soil, the water moves from the roots through the stems to the leaves. Once the water reaches the leaves, some evaporates from the leaves, adding to the amount of water vapor in the air. Now you know all of the stages of the water cycle. Go back and watch the video again so that you can memorize each stage. That's the end of the video, guys. Thanks for watching. Here's just a little fun fact. Did you know that 97% of the water on this planet is salt water? You can't drink it. Only 3% is fresh. So that doesn't leave a lot for us. In fact, here's another quick image. If we took all of the water on Earth and put it in this giant bottle, 97% is salt water. So go ahead and just throw that jug away because you can't drink it. This is all the fresh water we get to drink down on the bottom. But of that 28 milliliters, 23 milliliters is frozen in ice caps and glaciers. Four milliliters is underground. Two drops is in lakes and rivers. And one drop is in soil and air. Kind of crazy, right? Thanks for watching. Peace out.